It is Wednesday afternoon. I almost said Genesis 9. <laughs> Should we start again? You can pray for your teacher. It's Wednesday afternoon, August 9th, picking up in Bereshit in Genesis chapter 25. We'll start again verse word for word and verse for, by verse with about verse 7, but just that, that quick beginning that we looked at at the end of last class, we saw that Avraham, after Sarah's death, at least three years after, he's picked up uh, Keturah as a wife, um, wife slash concubine. It, she did not come in to uh, the, inherit the promises. Those have been passed down or are being passed down to Yitzhak, Isaac, the son of promise, and they'll go on down through the line. Uh, but at the same time, God's going to bless them with six sons that were listed. I'm not going to try to go through the names again. Uh, and then from those sons came sons, and from these came the Arab nations. We were looking at that last week, and I believe we get into that some more now, so I won't go into it in detail, but we do see um, that uh, in verse 5, I want to put point out that when Avraham gave all that he had to Yitzhak, that's a picture of us also, that when we come into Yeshua, into Jesus, we inherit what is his inheritance that came from the Father to the Son. He not only created it all, he's heir of it all, and we become joint heirs with him. We looked at that last week also. But in verse 6, picking up to have our thoughts as we go on with the rest of the chapter, we see that Abraham uh, gave all he had, all that was the promise, his land, his inheritance, and the, the promises that were from God, and we'll talk more about those as we go on also. That all went to Yitzhak. That went to the son, the one that was promised, who was to inherit. But to the other sons, to those from Keturah now, the sons of his, and as it puts it here, concubines, which is like a wife, but not quite on that same level, not getting all the privileges that the original wife had, Abraham still gave gifts while he was still living. I like that. He gave while he knew where it would go. He could be involved and he could direct it, and he did. And he gave gifts to his sons, and then he sent them away from his son Yitzhak eastward. So they moved east. We'll look at that in just a bit. They moved to the land of the east. Uh, I'll have maps up in, in a short time. But here the point just being... You know, Abraham was very blessed. He had lots of flocks and herds and, and all. We know that. We saw the contention before because of all that he had and, and others too. You know, you can't have everybody living on top of each other and the flocks, the shepherds and all fighting over the grass and the, the food for the shot flocks. Okay, let's try flocks and herds. <laughs> <laughs> wow, Rochelle. <laughs> Thankfully, the Holy Spirit's the teacher, not me. Anyway, um, so he, he told the sons, he blessed them, gave them, uh, I'm sure, a very nice amount in their gifts, and then go on, move farther away, go find land for yourself where you can live out your life in peace and prosperity. At the same time, you won't infringe and cause issues with Yitzhak. I also wonder, and this is only a wonder on my part, but I don't know how many of them really were God-fearers. We know that Yitzhak was, but Keturah coming from a background where the family was heathen, you know, com coming from the area, um, easily could have been like Hagar, she was Egyptian. There could have been an influence also, and it could have been that Abraham was thinking, I don't want commingling, I don't want the, the grandsons and the great-grandsons mixing with those who are not god fears. I'm just, I'm wondering, I don't know. But he does tell them to go on their way, he gives them to help them get going. But it's very clear that the promise, and what is his promise, will stay with Yitzhak. Yes? Okay, for my benefit yes sure so when Isaac married he gave everything to Isaac right? yes so then he married this lady and had kids within that time he got rich again and prosper and then had enough to give the boys their part even when he gave the inheritance to Yitzhak and we'll get into this well when we talk about the birthright oh, and all that no 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 it's, it's a good question now too I don't believe that he gave down to his last penny everything that he had, and so he had nothing else to give the others. But he gave what God had promised, the land, 
and the promises that go along with the seed that would lead down to Messiah. That was all kept here. But I imagine that he was able to give flocks and herds to the others too. He would have given in a birthright the oldest, and will act like Yitzhak's the oldest here because he's older than the others, but he's not Abraham's oldest. But the oldest would receive a double portion because he had double of the responsibilities. But the other sons would get blessings also from the father. So I think it was in that manner. He gave Isaac the most important and he gave him the most, but he had to give to the others too. And I do think God continued to bless him and he continued to prosper and continued to grow. So as time moved on, yes, he'd have more to give. So. Was uh, Keturah an Arab? Well, we think that she probably um, came from, and I said it, I brought it out last time and I don't have it in front of me, um, so I don't remember all the detail, but we, we believe that she probably was, um, I had the, uh, I think it was Midianites. Let me come back to you on that. I wish I remembered everything I taught, and usually I have my notes from the class before prior in front of me, and I don't today, and of course that's when I get caught off guard. <laughs> but, um, but she was not, um, she, she had to have been from within you know, the reach. Um, very likely, like Hagar, when Hagar was brought in as a handmaid, there were probably others brought in also, and we did look at the fact that Keturah probably was a lot younger than Avraham, probably was within his household. And he took a shine to her and added a little more to what she got in being in his household than all the other handmaids brought her in as a wife. So she had a few more privileges, and you can read between those lines. <laughs> but she probably, she could easily come out of an Egyptian background like Gar did. You know, probably, again, among the handmaidens, the, the, we, we call them slaves also, but they weren't treated necessarily in a way that you think when you hear that word slave. You know, but uh, they just didn't have um, all and the freedom of all that, that, you know, like Hagar had to do what Sarah said. So, you know, there was, there was a lesser stand, but it's still... Abraham, I believe, because we don't see different, that he was treating them all with a kindness. But it's a, a concubine has an S on it, so he had... He, the, apparently he had more than, um, than the one... Um, I wish I had brought... Maybe I did. Maybe I did. No? Okay. No, I don't have it here. Yeah, I see it here and I see it in the plural. Um, this is the only one that we're told of by name. But it was common and accepted in that time that you did have a wife and then you had the others who were concubines. We see it all the way down to uh, Jacob marrying Leah and Rachel. They both were wives, but their handmaids would have been like concubines. Um, and it was not looked upon as a mistress. It wasn't looked upon as, and I went through that, the laws of Hammurabi for the time and all this was acceptable. It was not, um, it was not an illicit affair. When God revived him, he surely did. Exactly. God revived Abraham's <laughs> body well because he did continue to reproduce. But again, Keturah wasn't 90. You know, we have no reason to believe that she was that old, you know. And she easily could have grown up in his household, and she could have loved the, the Avraham's God. You know, it could be that there wasn't a problem with that. It's just the room they needed to spread out and they needed to go, you know. Okay, but, but he never, it never says that he had concubine before that. Right, right. And before Sarah passes away, I don't think he did. Because, you know, she gave him Hagar, that was his concubine. So in essence, it could be these two. When I think about it, it could be Hagar and Keturah. Because, you know, I don't know. I don't know when it's saying, though, that to the sons of the concubines, um, uh, it, you know, we're trying to read and understand, but we have in verse 2 who Keturah bore, um, and then we have, you know, like Midian's one of her sons. Verse 4, we have his sons. All these were the sons of Keturah. Um, 
but to the sense of his concubines. I still see it in plural. I see what you're saying. I'll do a little more research and see if I can find out anything, but it would be in historical evidence. It would not be biblical, because all we know about biblically is this. So whether it's plural, meaning because he had Agar as a, as a concubine also, or whether it means that he, that he had more concubines, he, the only other one we know he married is Keturah because it makes that very clear. He took another wife, and that's singular, so. He was supposed to be a great nation. <laughs> yes, and, and nations would come from him. Hagar was promised that, that out of her son would come 12 nations, and we saw 12 nations come. And as we go down through this, we're going to go through some of the nations that come out of Keturah's sons also, uh, very much filling our Arab population of today. Twelve nations? Yes. Came out. out of six sons. Uh, the, the twelve nations were out of Hagar, Hagar's son Ishmael. Ishmael. Oh, okay. Yeah. But but the sons, we just, we don't know, except we'll see. Let me get through a few of these verses, and you'll see where some of the uh, migration went. Um, yeah. When we get down to... It looks like maybe verse 13 is the first time I'll start bringing you some of where the line went. Um, that's going to especially be Ishmael's line, but again, these were the Arab lines. There's, uh, they were not the Jewish, what would become the Jewish line. There's no Jewish line yet. Remember, Avraham is not Jewish. Avraham is a Syrian, and I got to separate that. He's not a Syria. You're going to see that on the map too. So let me get going, and if you still have questions I don't answer, bring them back up. But I, I think it might help as we continue to move forward because even though we'll be looking at Ishmael's line, it would be still the line of these sons also. There would have been a mixture there. So we have the sad verse, and I really don't like this verse. <laughs> we have verse 7. These are all the years of Abraham's life that he lived, 175 years. Abraham breathed his last and died at a good old age, an old man satisfied with life, and he was gathered to his people. Okay, he lived 30 years after Sarah died. So he had time to be married to Keturah and produce children. When he's 175, that makes Yitzhak, Isaac, 75. And Jacob and Esau, our twins, are 15 years old when Abraham dies. So even though you haven't been introduced to his grandsons yet, Abraham was introduced to his grandsons. He did get to know them for 15 years. We know that because Yitzhak is 60 years old when they're born. If you don't trust me, peek down at verse 26. We'll get there in order, but that tells you where I get my information. <laughs> so, um, you know, we tend to compartmentalize, or at least I do. We put our Bible people in boxes and we separate them, and we study them separated, and we don't see the overall. But when Shem lived 600 years after the flood, we have him come down very close into this time. So, you know, we've got an override of people that could easily have been mixing and knowing each other, at least to some degree, you know, but we tend to not think that way, so I wanted to bring it out for you. When it says that he breathed his last and died, or if you have old King James, he gave up the ghost and died, the Hebrew says he breathed out his breath. He didn't breathe back in. There was no breath left in him, and we know that God breathed into man. He became a living soul. But this was at a good old age. He was 175, and God had promised him that all the way back in Bereshit, Genesis 15 and verse 15, and I'll read it for you if you don't want to turn to it. It's you may because it's just a few pages. But chapter 15 and verse 15, God had said, As for you, speaking to Abraham, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You will be buried at a good old age. So he told them and he kept his word. No surprise there. The Hebrew says that he was old and satisfied. And that's, that's something really to... Um, to be thankful for. Um, he lived a full life. It wasn't cut short in our estimation. It was fully rounded out. And he, the reason why I feel the, the sadness is the description God gave of him was he was a friend of God. And that's what I want to be said of me. She's a friend of God. 
I want it to be that the reflection goes to God rather than to the person. And we see that Abraham is mentioned 70, S, S, E, okay, seven zero, <laughs> 70 times in the British Hadashah, in the New Covenant. 70 times. So long past his age in reality, he's still being spoken of, brought up for an example, reflected on, because he had something of value to share with us continually. We're talking about him in 2023 AD. That's a long time since. Well, what about uh, Noah's uh, children after the flood? We don't hear that much. Like I say, we know Shem was still alive 500, 600 years after the flood, but we don't hear that much. We know the line came down through. We know Avraham is of that line. But we don't hear that much. Um, you know, we've got a bare outline, and look at how much there is to study. I've got 66 books that I will never get to the end of study, no matter how many days God gives me on this earth, and no matter how many hours I get to plug into that. Every time I study something I've studied before, I get something new. I get another layer. I get more depth. I get more nuggets. So it's endless. And I think, wow, you know, this has to be just a bare outline, just a sketch for us of all that has taken place. If Abraham lived 175 years, and we have studied him long, he's been many of the chapters here, but how much more happened in those 175 years? You know, God picked out what he felt was important for us to know, and that's why he uses him as such an example. Moshe, Moses, is the only one mentioned more in the British Hadashah than Abraham. He gets 80 times mentioned, but uh, um, let me make one sentence and then I'll come right to you. Abraham, overall, if we look at him, I think he is remarkable. He lived long, but he didn't live perfect. And that's another reason why he's important. That encourages us, not giving us an excuse to not be perfect, but to realize God uses imperfect people. He didn't look for a perfect person. He didn't find one that was bigger than life, that was greater than everybody else, and say, aha, here's our superhero. No, he said, here's a man. This is a man who has a heart toward me, a man who I'm going to be able to call my friend. I can work through him. And yes, he's going to make mistakes, and I'm going to let the whole world know. I mean, that's one reason why I'm glad the Bible is not being written now, is I wouldn't want my dirty laundry hung out for people to talk about 2,000 years later. But Abraham gets that. And yet he also, we see that walk of faith. We see that walk develop. And we see him end on a good note where he is spiritually mature, where he's not a baby, where he's not getting off track all the time, and where he can be called a friend of God. Now I'll show you that two times, just uh, once in the original covenant and once in the Brit Hadashah, just to show you it covers the whole gamut. And that's why I think he's remarkable, and I do feel like uh, he's special. You know, someone that I look forward to meeting in heaven one day and saying, you know, tell us more about you. But I think we got the best. I think we know exactly what we do need to know. But we can ask him, <laughs> how many concubines did you have? Who were they? Where did they come from? <laughs> He'd probably look at us and say, that's what you want to focus your attention on? <laughs> Don't miss the picture over here, because that's what God emphasized also. I told you I'd say it one sentence, come to you, Dora, but I won't forget you. I'll be there in a moment. Second Chronicles chapter 20 and verse 7 says, Did you not, O our God, drive out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and give it to the descendants of Abraham, your friend, forever? I love that. Which way is that forever talking about? That God gave him the land forever or that Abraham was his friend forever? And I'll tell you, it probably means the land, but I'm going to say it means both. He was his friend forever, and he gave that land forever. But when he's telling Israel that he's given them that land, we hear him call Abraham his friend. That's with 2 Chronicles 20 and verse 7. And now we are going to look at, and I lost my reference, James 2.23. In the New Testament, James 2 and verse 23. And here we will read, when I can get down there. And the scripture was fulfilled which says, quote, And Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Anyone remember what chapter? 
Okay, chapter 15, verses 5 and 6. When God took him out, showed him the story of the gospel throughout the stars of Genesis. Of Genesis. That's where Abraham believed that it was counted to him for righteousness. That's what's being quoted here in James 2.23, but then he rounds out that verse and he said, and he was called the friend of God. That's precious. 15 verses 5 and 6 is where he, it said that um, Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Oh, yeah. we, we talked long about that phrase when we were on chapter 15. So here we see James knew it. Um, the writer of the, the Chronicles knew it. They, they kept the Chronicles. They kept the records. And here in the records is the expression of, of Abraham being a friend of God. And I think that's special. Genesis 15, 4. That's what you got in your notes here. Uh, yeah, I may want that for another reason. It's, it, you can start with 4, but it's definitely 5 and 6 where you're going to get the quote. Um, you're, I'm looking to see if I've got a reference in here, and I don't, but... You got, um, Micah 5, 2, we're, we're not there yet. We're not there yet. Yeah, yeah. I, this, this is where the Holy Spirit's teaching, and, and this came in. It's not on your list. That's, I think, what's throwing you is um, for, the, for Linda to understand, those who've been with me have cross-references that what I bring up in class, I've given to them ahead of time, but I don't stick to the script, so to speak. If the Lord leads me another direction, I'm bringing in whatever. And so that was a scripture that we had talked about before, and I did not have it planned, but it's, again, what came out today, and I believe that's by the Spirit of God directing. I'm going back real quickly since there's the question. Yeah, verse 4 is not what you want right now. That'll be um, later. Verse 5 of Bereshit of Genesis 15. And he, God, took him, Avraham, outside and said, Look toward the heavens. Count the stars. Remember we saw in Hebrew, narrate. Tell if you can. If you're able to narrate them. If you're able to tell about them. And he said to him, to Avraham, So shall your descendants be. Then, verse 6, Abraham believed in the Lord, and he reckoned it to him as righteousness. There's your direct quote in verse 6. And remember, I asked the question, if this is just face value, that God told Abraham, you're going to have a lot of children. When does believing you're going to be a big family make you righteous in God's sight? And the answer is nowhere. There's nowhere in Scripture that teaches that that just because you believe that, that God's going to give you lots and lots of children? No, that's, that's our faith walk with him when he speaks to us. But what makes us righteous is believing in the shed blood of Yeshua Jesus for the salvation of our souls. It is seeing him as the substitute to take the punishment of sin, which is death for us. And he, being God, was able to be raised from the dead, conquer death, conquer the power of sin, and wash that away from us, permanently removed. Believing in that means we believe in Jesus as the only way to God, the only way when he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And when we say, yes, I believe that you took my place, you took my punishment, I ask you to be my savior, to wash away my sin, so that I can be in your presence one day, then, then the Lord says, you are mine, and I'm putting my robe of righteousness on you. God now looks at us through that robe of righteousness and declares us righteous. What Abraham saw in those stars was the foretelling of the coming of Yeshua as the one who would be the sacrifice for all time. He saw his death, burial, and resurrection. That's why John 8, if I remember right, I think it's 858, says that Abraham saw my day and he rejoiced. And the, the Pharisees were saying, Abraham saw your day? He's, you're not even 50 years old. Abraham was thousands of years ago. How did he see your day? Well, this is how. He saw it when he stood before God. God took him and showed him through the map in the heavens. Amazing. But what a God. What a mind. What brilliance. What plan. And made it so clear. And Abraham said, I see it. And I believe in him, and I believe he will come one day, and he will wash away my sin, and I put my faith in him, and God said, righteous, righteous. I declare it as if it's been done. 
it's completed. It will be carried out in history, but it's completed. And there we have the righteousness of Avraham. Rhonda, just before I get you, I promised to Dora. <laughs> well, I was just going to say, maybe Abraham didn't have any concubines because look at what happened with one of them. And, and the promised son <laughs> had to come first, otherwise there would be a lot of... If, if Avraham, if there had been anything going on, remember when he gave Sarah to Abimelech, Abimelech? If, if he had in any way touched her sexually, for all history, everybody would say, we don't know who Isaac belonged to. But God saw to it and put it out in the scriptures, declaring it historical fact, biblical fact. He didn't touch her. God woke him up in a dream and said, you're a dead man. She belongs to another. And Avimelech took Abraham to task and said, you know, the next day when he confronted him, why didn't you tell me she was your wife? And what if we had laid with her? You know, he confessed very clearly he had not, but what if he had? And God warned, if you do now, you're dead. It's, it's done, it's over. He, but Avimelech had enough fear of that God that he did not. So there was no question. And yes, the concubines have to be long after. I believe if there's more than one, it's after Keturah. You know, the, that's why I'm willing to say the concubines are Hagar and Keturah, that we know everything that Abraham so did. So is that where Hagar came from, when the, the king gave him all this service yes. and all that stuff? Yes, yes. When Avimelech sent Abraham back, or, or gave him, you know, all of that, that, yes, that's where Hagar came from. And um, sometimes, you know, when we sow where we shouldn't be, then we do reap something that we wish we had. Okay, and my other comment was going to be, maybe it's for later, but since it came up here, do we all breathe a last breath before we die? I never thought about it. So it, it do we all breathe the last breath before we die? Yes. As long as we are breathing, we are alive. <clears throat> but what that means is when you stop breathing, you've breathed your last and it's done and it's over. Um, and I can attest to that fact that when my dad was going home to be with the Lord, I was the one with him. And many a time, my sister and I were both with him together at different times, but it was myself at the very end. Many times we thought, because he, he had like a sleep apnea, so we thought, that's it. That was the last breath. And when this started in the hospital, even when the nurses that was with us, all three of us girls, I can still see as our eyes got really big because it was like a full minute. But then he breathed again. He hadn't breathed his last. But I was with him when he just so smoothly, no fight, no nothing, just slipped out of his earth body and slipped into the presence of the Lord. I have been at the presence of a number of believers going home to heaven, and I have never seen one struggle, fear, panic, you know, no, it's always everyone has just very easily slipped into the presence of the Lord, one with a smile on his face, yes, you know, it, and it, it attests to the mercy of our God, even I believe they're already being ministered to by the angels that are about us, that are ministering to those who are receiving their salvation, and I believe it to be true, yes, that even in the midst of that, that's why martyrs can go out in such glory, yeah. why Stephen being stoned to death could have his face aglow and see heaven opened up. Oh, I could go on. I could, I could end our class because I could go for over an hour on story after story like Loretta. Yeah, I won't. No worries. I'll, I'll stay on track. But, um, but yes, I will agree with you. You know, they, they came in later. They did not come in before. And nothing touched the fact that we know with no shadow of a doubt Yitzhak was the son that was conceived by Abraham and Sarah. It was, he was not immaculate born like the virgin birth of Yeshua Jesus, but it was a miraculous birth because we got two dead bodies, one at 90 and one at 100 or 89 and 99 because give him nine months to, to bear the son. 
But we know God said he would restore the bodies, and we know that's what he did. That's Hebrews 11 that speaks about that. So, um, so Yitzhak was a miraculous birth, just not a virgin-born birth. It was the conceiving of the two who came together. Rhonda, finally. And poor Dora had to wait so long. Can you help her? Try again? Wait, oh, a wait mouse. a second. I to find a mouse. <laughs> yeah, and find where. There we go. Okay, try to unmute, Rhonda. There we go. And, um, I know you taught on this when you taught on Genesis 15 about count is really the equivalent of Mary. Yes. But I, I did a study on that word count to, to equal Mary. Is there something more that gets us to Mary other than just bringing all the scriptures together? Or it's is, the, the, is that. The meaning of the Hebrew word means count, narrate, tell, uh, and we see that consistently throughout. So when you go into uh, something like a Strong's, uh, that'll give you the uh, origination of the word. That's where we can get what the meanings of those words were, and it's always used um, with one of those words. That it didn't mean count one, two, three, but it meant narrate it, tell it like it's a story, you know, give that. Mm -hmm. So that comes out of that word, and it is the same word in um, Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God. The word declare in our English is the same word narrate or tell or what, what um, our English put count in Genesis 15. So, and we know how do the heavens declare the glory of God? Well, I just told you, through the gospel being told in the stars, through so much more than just that one level, but that the, the declaration, how do you declare something you tell, you speak? So, uh, and, and I think verse four of Psalm 19 says that the speech of the night, the stars that speak at night, something like that. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, so, um, so, so go ahead. So, do you remember what that word was? I can word. get it. I can get, let me see if I can get it real fast. If I can't, I will get it for you next week. But I still have one of my sources open that gives me the Hebrew words. So let me go real quick, and I should be able to have it for you in just a moment. And I have done the study on it, too. I didn't just take it from what I'd been taught. I went and looked. What are you looking for? The word that's narrate, tell, declare in Hebrew. Um, in Genesis 15, 6, in um, Psalm 19 and verse 1. Okay, 15, 6, there we go. And I go to my Hebrew. Um, oh, it must be 15, 5. Sorry. Coming right up, I hope. My tablet's very slow. There we go. Okay. Okay, here's count. Um, okay. Hold on one second. I have to open several sources. Okay, it's Safar. In our English, we would spell it S-A-P-H-A-R. We do pronounce it kind of like you just heard, saw and far. And I like that. Now even remember, and this was my mnemonic to help me remember, Avraham saw far off in the distance and he believed. Safar is the word. <laughs> so it comes back to me when I, when I study. Um, and it means to count or recount, to relate, to declare, to measure. That's where they get the counting again, but it's not measure like your measuring cup. Um, but it, it's a measurement that gives us a standard, so to speak, take into account. And even one time it, it's translated the word utter. We utter, you know, we can utter it. So that's the word, and I will verify right now that it's also in Psalm 19. Just a second. Whoops, I hit Psalm 4. Sorry. Psalm 19. And it'll be in verse 1. Um, yes, and there it is. In, in the plurality is Safarim, which is, is more <coughs> plural. It's, it's, it's like because it's the heavens declaring, there's more than one speaking it. There's more than one. It's not just all in a star or in just, it's the, all of the heavens are declaring. So it, the Hebrew is safarim. I am is plural in Hebrew. 
That's like our S or ES in our English. <clears throat> so it is, um, if you have a Strong's Concordance, some of you may have, and you want a resource study on your own, it's number 5608. Strong's <laughs> is 5608. Um, Strong's is highly um, valued across the board. You know, not it's just 5608. What is that? The page number? That, no, that's the number of the word in Strong's Concordance. Yeah, um, if you don't know how to use a Strong Concordance, you won't understand. But if you know how to use, you know what that does for you. And I can show you later. I can pull it out and show you. That's one source. I have another source. That's the etymology of the words. that I can go back into my Hebrew. And they're always in agreement. I've never seen a disagreement. And like I say, they're used by people far more knowledgeable in language than I am, and not by a denomination, but by those who call ourselves believers in Jesus. You know, I, I don't think anybody argues with them. Um, they just, they're able to give those of us like me who are limited in our language abilities help. You know, it, it's like calling on the professor to help you understand that algebraic equation. And you, when he explains it to you, you can say, okay, I get it. But then later, can you go do it all on your own? Not necessarily. You'll go back to your help again. <laughs> I go back to my help because I'm not, my dad was the one who had the Hebrew, but I wish he'd passed down to me. <laughs> but, you know, time is of the essence. And some of you may be linguists and you pick up a language easily. I can pick it up, but I'm going to study hours and hours to learn it, you know. So I thank the Lord for what I have, but it is an area I try to enrich myself in all the time. But I'm saying that because I want that, the, the, the humbleness of me. I don't want you to think that I'm this Hebrew scholar that's Hello. got it all. No, 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 no. But I do check and I double check and I don't take one word for it. I, you know, by the time I'm presenting it to you, I'm uh, my whole heart is um, conv convinced of it. Convinced it's not convicted but convinced so because you can hear a lot of things about word um, or, or origination and sometimes it's right on and sometimes you wonder well, okay well, where did they go you know how did they get there so um, so when I bring you out the Hebrew that I have seen um, there's another source they, they are absolutely Hebrew scholars and they try to bring it down to my level <laughs> but sometimes they still talk over my head so anyway any more questions or comments are we satisfied i love genesis 15 5 and 6 i could take the whole class on that you know i've done it so <laughs> if you want the archive let me know and i'll get you a link to it um, those of you who know the bitly site is on there um, I've taught it other times. I'm sure it'll come up again. Um, it's a favorite of mine because when you see the scriptures all put together and we go from Bereshit all the way into the, the New Covenant into Hebrews and, and you see the same thing being said and you, you it, wow, wow, what a God, what amazing. He just, he's so brilliant. He blows my little peon brain. Sorry, folks, but there's, there's the truth of the matter. <laughs> oh, compared to my God, I do. <laughs> compared to my God, I do. <laughs> so, um, so yes, breathing his last breath is where we came off. I do believe that that does mean that, you know, they did not, if they're living, they're going to continue breathing, you know, but that's one way that, that the doctors will verify that they're not alive, is they don't feel the breath, they don't hear the breath, and they go for the heartbeat. You know, there's several layers to declare someone dead, and that's one of them. Okay, so Avraham did, he did die, but he was old and satisfied. He lived a remarkable life, a long life, a life of faith. He had a relationship with God. I would even call him remarkably obedient because he stepped out and went not knowing anything. He didn't have the Word of God in front of him. He didn't have all the examples we have, but he stayed true to what God did reveal to him. God did call him a friend of his, and I think it's beautiful. When it says in verse 8 that he was gathered to his people, the Hebrew says to his father's kin. That's the idea it gives behind the word for people. It was to those in his, he was related to. Um, so obviously from this, we're not talking about the place where he was buried. I'm going to jump ahead and tell you he's going to be buried in the cave of Machpelah. 
Anyone remember who is buried there right now in our story? Sarah. 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 Is anyone else buried in the cave of Machpelah? No. Nobody? Not at this point. Not right now. So he bought the plot, he bought the land to bury Sarah. She's the only one buried there. So if it's saying that he was gathered to his father's people or to his father's kin, to his kinfolk, to his relatives, it, it, it's talking about those in his line who have departed before him. So that's literally a reference to what in scripture is later called Sha'ol, S-H-E-O-L. And remember, Sha'ol had like two compartments. Luke 16 shows us this. They had the side that came to, to the euphemism given to it is Abraham, Abraham's bosom. And I think it even stems from this. Abraham's one of the earliest ones we know of in death. And we know that he went to a place where there were others that other departed spirits, others who had died before him. So because we don't know those others' names, it's not telling us. We know that Enoch had walked with God. He wasn't found here on earth. We know that he, he departed this earth. But we seem to just have more of a gathering thought of souls that have gone before with this. I think that's how it got nicknamed Abraham's bosom. We saw it also had a suffering side, but there was a gulf in between and nobody could cross back and forth. Right. And the suffering was forever and the, the paradise side was forever. And that's where all the, you know, the saints went the paradise before Christ. Right. Loretta's got the whole story and I'm proud of her. That before Yeshua Jesus died on the cross, this is where believers went when they died. Their spirit, I'm talking about, the body went into the grave. But it's not a soul sleep. It's not that they no longer existed and they're waiting to be awakened by God one day. No, we know even later when they do get to go into the presence of God, which took place after the resurrection of Yeshua Jesus, that all Paul said to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. He didn't say there's a time gap in between. And here we don't see a time gap either. Abraham went to where other departed spirits have gone. God had a, a collecting place for them. It's called in scripture Abraham's bosom later. It's called Sha'ol many a time through scripture. It's not referring to the grave. It's referring to a place where the spirits have gone. Sarah's body is in the cave of Machpelah. Abraham's body is going to be put in the cave of Machpelah. If there's anything left of those bodies, I know they're ashes by this point, but if there's anything left, they're still in that cave. That's their DNA. If we could resurrect them and, and figure DNA out, and if we had a sample of Abraham and Sarah's DNA, we would say, hey, here they are. God's going to do that. We don't. So this is the first time it comes on the Bible about pretty much heaven and earth? I mean, that there is a hell? It, I think in my mind it's the first time that we are hearing about a collecting spot for the spirits that have departed ahead. We know that it goes all the way back, that Adam and Eve went somewhere when they, their bodies departed. In Judaism, heaven's called Gan Eden, the Garden of Eden. And they equate it to what God gave Adam and Eve before sin hit. They think that's a picture of paradise, it's a picture of heaven, and so they call it that. So in Judaism, they would say it goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden. But regardless, we know God had a place prepared for when death did take the, the body, the soul. Because the soul is what God breathed in and they became a living being. Remember, he had made a body for Adam out of the dust of the ground, but Adam wasn't alive until God breathed in. So when the soul entered, because that's God breathed, that can't die. That goes on forever. That's why your soul or your spirit, it goes on forever. Your shell that, that covered it, so to speak, you know, that, that exists on the outside, that's what goes back to the dust of the ground. It returns to what it was made out of. So in other words, the breath is, is the soul? Yeah. When you yeah. breathe through your last breath, the soul... Is what's departed, yes. And that's part of the yes. emotions, right? Emotions, the the Soul and spirit, they say, are the emotions, the, the real you, the who you are, you know, all of that, yes. Yeah. They split the fine line between what's the soul and what's the spirit. And if I remember right, the soul is the emotions and the spirits, the breath, 
that, that God breathed in. I could have that backwards. I get dyslexic. Don't quote me. <laughs> but uh, but we know, you know, that that's why it's not that it's all over at the grave. And really, honestly, that wouldn't be fair or right because if there was no judgment afterward, then the scriptures that God gives us of everyone standing before God in judgment, the unsaved before Him at the great white throne, if they weren't resurrected to stand before God in judgment for the deeds they did on this earth, then yeah. Eat, drink, and be merry, folks, because it's all over one day, and who cares? That's the end. You know, no, but that's totally against everything our scripture teaches us. Yes, Rhonda? Helper? Rhonda? We have to on two sides. I thought it stayed that way. <laughs> there we go. Okay. Okay, try again. Try, there we go. I don't, I don't want to get off track, but... Those people that died before Christ, where their spirits are in paradise, in Abraham's bosom, they t came out when Christ went down there or at the rapture? We see that there were some graves opened at the time of the death of Yeshua Jesus, and after he resurrected, we see that some went back into the city and gave testimony to the resurrection from the dead. Remember we talked about that, the, you know, let's say Uncle Joe had died a few months before and all of a sudden you get a knock at your door and here he is, something's happened, you know you buried him a little while ago. So there was like a first fruits, but those who have preceded us in death, even though there is that change from in the heart of the earth where Luke 16 tells us this is and where I believe that Avraham went and all the people up until that time, even though the paradise side has been removed and placed in heaven, the spirits going into heaven, into the presence of the, of the Lord where they're waiting now. Um, what's the finish of my sentence? I believe that, that to be true. And we see that in several different, in Ephesians and in um, Colossians, Philippians, let me see, where it talks about how when after Yeshua had um, raised from the dead, that he led captivity captive. Basically what it's, the picture that it's giving us is that he took, in my crude way of saying it, he made like a pathway from Sheol, the heart of the earth, the paradise side, into heaven. The reason why it's open into heaven now is now the blood that had to be on the mercy seat for the forgiveness of sin, perfect, sinless blood, not the blood of bulls and goats and lambs, but the sacrificed lamb of God, Seha Elohim, has now been placed on the real mercy seat, the one in heaven that is keeping heaven pure and clean as humankind comes into heaven now through the way that Yeshua Jesus made on the cross. When he put his blood on that mercy seat in heaven, now it could be open so that we could go directly into the presence of God because now our sins weren't just covered as the picture of the, the bulls and the goats and the lambs did. Now we're told Yeshua Jesus' perfect sinless blood washed it all away. So now it's pure blood that lasts forever, that's put on the mercy seat in heaven so that we can go into heaven because we come in through that shed blood, which means we come in in a righteous standard in, into the presence of a holy God. So, so, so it's, what it is saying is that Yeshua, in essence, took those who were in, and I'm going to call it the holding tank, <laughs> and he paraded them right through and into heaven. When an enemy would win over another country, when they would come back home with their booty, they would come parading through the main street. They'd be on their horses and they'd be proud and, and behind them would be all the booty they got. Whether it was gold and silver and, and things like that, it also had people that were now their slaves. That would be a chain that would be being dragged along many a times in an embarrassing manner, read between the lines but it was a show of their victory. And I believe that because we know the prince of the power of this air temporarily is Satan. 
Scripture tells us that. We don't fight against flesh and blood. We fight against principalities, powers of darknesses in high places. We, we know that it refers to him being in the air. We know that he puts thoughts into our minds through the airwaves. And so the Lord made a path right through Satan's domain that he has temporary um, influence in and took them straight through into the presence of Jehovah God and Satan couldn't touch a one of them. He couldn't grab one of them. He couldn't pull them out. It, it's just like the children of Israel party, when the Red Sea parted, went straight through. I believe that when it's saying that he led captivity captive, that he took those captive souls that were waiting their redemption of Yeshua's blood, and he took them into the presence of, of Jehovah now, so that now when a believer died, when Shaul Paul died, when Stephen died, remember when he died, and this is your first martyr after Yeshua's resurrection, very soon after that, he didn't say, I see into the heart of the earth. He looked up and he said, the heavens are open and I see the Son of Man standing on the right hand of the Father. Now the Father's not on the throne in Sheol and the Son's not standing at the right hand of the Father in Sheol. That's in heaven. And when Sheol Paul later says that he was caught up into heaven, into the third heaven, that's up in, in heaven. That's not in the heart of the earth. Stephen saw it. Paul saw it. It's a real place. And why would Stephen see it up there if he was going to depart into Sheol? He wouldn't have. But that was the change that had now taken place. So now for all of us, 2,000 years later, when we leave this shell, we go right up. We don't go into the holding tank. The unbelievers still go into the holding tank suffering side. They're being held there until God takes them out of that and stands them before him at the great white throne judgment that's coming only for unsaved. No believer stands at the great white throne judgment in condemnation. We may stand there to say, when an unsaved tries to say, well, I, I never heard, and Rondell say, I'm sorry, but you lived at my time, and I spoke to you, and you denied. You wouldn't listen. You know, we may do that, but we will not stand there for condemnation. We've stood before the Bema Seat. That's the Bema Seat of, of Yeshua, Jesus, for reward or lack of reward. That's in heaven. Notice you're in heaven. You're not staying there to find out whether you get to go in or not because you don't go in or, or not on the basis of your work. You go in or not on the basis of Yeshua's blood and whether it's been applied to your life or not. So the believers who are at the Bema Seat of Christ are not being judged for their works for salvation. They're being judged by the, for their works for reward or loss of reward. And that's all that, they, that they're standing for there. I still need so, to get you the um, verses. Go ahead. Go ahead, Rhonda. Uh, so the people that were in the um, holding tank, yes. their bodies are still there, right? Yes. Yes. And so when the rapture happens, their body goes up and our body goes up. Let me, let me correct myself. The body's wherever it got buried. Abraham's body is still in the cave of Machpelah. The spirit right. and the body are different. So the bodies are wherever the bodies have been buried. And yes, in the rapture, those bodies come up and meet their spirit in the air and they're turned into that incorruptible forever body that we also get the moment that we come up in rapture just what a hair behind those who preceded us in death that preceded us in rapture because we're all caught up changed immediately into that immortality that can go into heaven that isn't going to disintegrate or blow up and it's all done the dead in Christ first the believers who are alive at that time all of that's done in the twinkling of an eye so you don't have time to say oh here's the dead and, and I'm waiting in line <laughs> no in a split second unless you are in the presence of the Lord forever with your new body and you are greeting those who preceded you in death. That's where I'm going to see my mom, my dad, my brother, my great aunt, and I could go on and on and on, my cousins, those who are dear to me in the faith. And that's where we all will have that grand reunion. I can only imagine the, the joy and the ecstasy, but all of that dims with the first thought for all of us. Sing, sing the face of Yeshua. You know, God says, blessed are those who believe who haven't seen. That's us. 
And yet one day, what we by faith believed will be sight. You know what's really great is also, um, I was explaining to him, you know, the, you know, the, God still uses people to bring oh, miracles. Too. You know, to, for his reason, we don't know, you know, what God does, and I'm not going to question yes or no. I was my Lord. You got the glory either way, you know. He glorifies he himself people, in the today. death of his saints. He glorifies yeah. himself in the miraculous healing of his saints. God's ways are above our ways, and His thoughts we above our use thoughts. We people for a different reason, for yes. only God knows why. Right, right, time. because he, He's got a whole picture, and we're seeing mm -hmm. this little tiny spot, and we're saying, I know how it should go. <laughs> <laughs> and I can hear God saying, really? <laughs> really, child? <laughs> really? My sister thinks she can have enough time to say, forgive me, I go, no, you don't. You don't have enough time to say, <laughs> I know. I know. You better make sure you're right before yes. you do that. Yes, yeah. No one has that moment in rapture. It's, it's sealed. Those who hear the sound heard because they were believers, not because they became believers as they heard it. There, there is not time. It's, it's less than a second. Science can't measure that yet. Yes, they can give you tenths of seconds, but they say the twinkle of the eye is faster than that. So... Amazing, amazing. But does that clarify? I'm thankful that you brought me back on track, Rhonda, that, that the bodies of believers, wherever they were, um, and we don't know what happened with those who went into the city and proved their resurrection um, because we're not told. But in my mind, because it does not tell us they hung around for years and they were seen later and they died again, which I don't believe they could because they've resurrected out of the dead, I believe that when Yeshua emptied the paradise side, they went with him. You know, that they had a few days on this earth, however, well, very, very few. In fact, I don't know. I don't know because Yeshua went so quickly up into heaven. Well, that's when he placed his blood on the, on the mercy seat. We don't know exactly the moment that this happened, but it would have been very, very soon. They weren't hanging around for a, a week, a month, a year, no. You know, they were there for a very short time to give eyewitness, and then they were, I, I believe, they were taken up into heaven also because they had resurrected from the dead, and, and they're not walking around here on this earth today. There's nobody <laughs> 2,000 years old today. But yes, did, go ahead. Didn't they stay in earth for 50 days just like the Lord, for the people to see them? Some believe that they ascended at the time of Yeshua, Jesus ascending into heaven because Acts 1 doesn't tell us that there were others there at that time. I have a hard time believing it's then. I think it's when he led captivity captive. That's a personal opinion, you know, and if you want to believe the other, it doesn't hurt my feelings. It's just, uh, and they say that too because the angel said, as you saw him go, you'll see him return in like manner, and he returns with the crowd of witnesses. So that's a proof for them to say that's how. But because we're not told, you know, we're told that the Talmudim were talking with him and they watched him be carried up. It didn't say, and others. So I just have a little hard time putting it there. But again, that's very personal. That's not here scripture and verse. Well, I agree in one way. It's because when he went down in the hell to the keys, and then went to the paradise area to grab him, I think those with him, in the instant, they just went, they just disappeared. When he took them, they, they would, it would have been instantly, yes. Um, and for those who think that the scripture is saying that, that Jesus went down and preached in hell and people had a chance to get saved, no, that, none of that is um, biblical. Yeshua, Jesus, went into the paradise side. He did not go into hell. When you were told that he went to hell and suffered for three days in hell, then why did he say on the cross, it is finished? It was over. No one comes out of hell. Satan himself has not been cast into hell. When he is, he does not ever come out. When the beast and the false prophet are cast in at the start of the millennial reign, they are seen there a thousand years later. That does away with the thought that, oh, they get burnt up and they're gone. They're annihilated and it's over. No. If that's over, then we get saved for a moment and it's over. No, both are eternal. Both are forever. Hell is forever, and our abode in heaven is forever. But no one comes out of hell. 
and Yeshua Jesus did not need to go into hell. He needed to shed his blood and put his blood on the mercy seat where, where God's holiness dwelt so that we could enter into a holy state through that shed blood. It was in our place. Instead of our blood being shed, which could not take care of our sin because it was sinless, it was sinful blood, that's what saved. It was, it was now sinless blood placed on the mercy seat. But it, 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 he, there's no way that he went into hell and he suffered. He told the thief on the cross, today you'll be with me in paradise. The forgiveness of the thief on the cross shows it's not by works. The thief couldn't get off that cross and do a thing to save himself. The only thing he'd do is cry out to God for his salvation, which he did. He heard, he saw what the others were doing. He started out reviling Yeshua Jesus also and then quickly stopped when he saw. I think when he saw Yeshua willingly lay down his life, I think he thought then, whoa, this one's different. And he, he immediately turned in faith to believe that this one, this one's the son of God. This one, is he's not like me. What about the keys? Now? That, was that in hell? And you took the keys from Satan? The scripture that talk about the keys doesn't come in at that same place, and that's talking about the power over hell, the power over heaven, the power over life. When we're told that we have the keys and what we bind on earth and it'll be bound in heaven, that's all talking about in our faith, and uh, it's it's not the power over who goes into hell or who comes out of hell. It, it was not, the keys are misunderstood in that way. Um, and yeah, especially... He, just, he took those keys, I wonder, he had to go somewhere down there to get them, <laughs> right? Well, it doesn't actually say that he took the keys from hell, that's what I'm saying. Go to your scriptures and look at them again, because there's a lot of uh, dogma that's added into that, that lead people down a path that is not biblical. So, um, yeah, the keys are more of a symbolic than an actual, and they weren't taken out of Satan's hands. He never had them. Satan's never had the power over who dies and who lives. God is the one who gives that power. Just the keys. Just the keys, Just the keys yeah. Yeah, yeah. But, but go look at your scripture again, and I think you'll see it differently. I'm still fighting. I know I'm all over it. I know it's somewhere. Did I just find it? Uh, no, I didn't. I know it's right here, and I can't believe I can't. It's Ephesians or Philippians, where it talks about leading captivity captive. Um, let me try again. I thought I could find it fast. Dora, did you have a question while I'm looking? Or a comment? No. Okay. I'm sorry. I thought you did. Um, okay. It's, gonna, it's either going to come back. Maybe it's chapter 4, and I went for 2. That's it. Chapter 4. Thank you, Lord. Ephesians chapter 4. Verses 8 through 10, uh, verse 7 tells us that every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. We're, for by grace are you saved through faith. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. That's what that's capping on in verse 7. Verse 8 says, Wherefore he said, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. So, and the gifts he gives unto men is the spirit of, of uh, the Holy Spirit comes onto men and they are given the gifts to minister, you know, in salvation here. But it goes on with verse 9. Now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? That's when Yeshua went into Sheol, into the paradise site. That's when he went in the lower parts of the earth first, then he ascended up into heaven took his blood, put it on the mercy seat, and he also ascended 40 days later where he stayed and is to this day and will call us up there. Verse 10, he that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens that he might fill or fulfill all things. Okay, um, And then it goes on with the gifts that, that he gave to, to prove my point in that with verse 11 on. It gave some apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, and it goes on with the gifts. But that's what it's talking about when it says, um, and again, leading captivity captive, that's like when, when scripture refers to captivity, it's, we think of it, oh, they're going into captivity, but sometimes it is the coming out. You have to keep it in the context and understand it. So those who have been captive, he now led captivity captive by, by removing them and taking them and placing them in heaven. Okay?
We did go on a side note, but I think this is important. We're here for the whole scripture and understanding the whole word of God. And I didn't realize it would come up with Abraham or would have had it quick on my, uh, but I'm thankful the Lord brought it back to my mind because I knew, I knew I was walking all over where those verses were. Well, that's important, um, you know, to know he, he went to the keys from death. He, he conquered death. Yeah, he, he conquered death. death. Yes, he didn't conquer hell in the sense there is still a hell. You're going to say, but there's still death. It's still, look for that verse, bring it to me, I'll bring it to you in this original, I'll help you understand a little better because I can't think where that one is right now either. But he did conquer. He did more than just cover. That's all the bulls and goats and sheep could do was cover. It was the substitute. This one dies in my place because this is a picture of Messiah who will die in my place. And in his blood, I'm believing. And he will save me from my sin because he, didn't, his, he wasn't dying for himself. He wasn't paying the punishment for himself. So he could say, it's not for me, it's for you, and for you, and for you, and for you. Yes, Dora. Okay, speaking about hell, hell is always going to be there, or after a thousand years, it's not going to exist anymore? No, it will always be there. It will be there through all of eternity. It says that we, will, we can see the smoke coming up from it. Just like in New York, I know it's off, but there was a, a crew that was digging so deep the We've the heard those stories. We've heard those stories, they, yes. They dug so deep that the dig it here screams. And they went and got their bosses. Can you hear this? And they wouldn't touch. They wouldn't dig no more. They just, I guess they covered it up and it hit big time because all the crew did not go back. It was so scary. Hearing the screams and smelling it, it was terrifying. And, and whether they tapped into something or not, we know hell right now is in the heart of the earth. But in eternity future, you know, God redoes this heavens and this earth. Hell is removed the same as oh, paradise has been removed. Uh, you need to mute Tony and Melly. Thank you. Sorry, guys. Um, hell it will be removed the same way paradise side has been removed. And when we read that Satan is cast into the lake of fire, it says it is forever. Forever can never end. Or we've got ourselves a major problem, folks. <laughs> and I think there was a reason that God allowed these guys, the, the crew, and it, it, could it, it could be, it could be that it makes people understand the reality of it. It could be, you know, there are those who will say, well, that's absolutely hearsay, and I'm not here to take either side, yeah. but I am here to say hell is real. And we need to be sharing with anyone around us how to escape the coming judgment. Yeah, because we don't want anyone to go to hell because we didn't speak up. Well, they won't go to hell because we didn't speak up. We will lose our opportunity for reward because we didn't speak up for the Lord. But he won't let anybody go to hell because you didn't tell him. No, he'll raise someone else up. You know, but I don't want to miss out on doing anything for the Lord he wants me to do. So, but yes, it goes on forever and ever. That's why it makes it very clear. When, when we see Satan cast into the lake of fire, we will see the false prophet and the Antichrist. When were they thrown into it? At the beginning, well, the end of the tribulation before the millennium started. So a thousand years later, they're still in it. That's proving it goes on, it goes on, it goes on, and we're told it is forever. And the beauty is that Nothing ever comes out of it. Satan can't come out of it. A lie can't come out of it. Nothing can start again. We don't have to ever fear. In our lives, we're taught history repeats itself. Israel remembers the Holocaust, so it won't get repeated. You know, where, where we see the repetition. But God assures us, never will lie enter heaven. Never will sin enter in. This is the short time. The eternity is in the glory, the perfection, the holiness. And, and even just that alone, when you think about hell being the absence of God, mm. that grabs it, me to the core, shakes me to the core. Absence of love, beauty, light, grace, mercy, joy. <sighs> to think someone could be in that position and know it goes on forever. <clears throat> Forever. There's no party in there. No. No, there's no party. It's so dark you can't even see your hand in front of you. So. 
Yeah, and if you don't understand that, if you've ever been in fire, and I have been in a house Why on fire, you, if you've yeah, ever yeah. been in it, it's it's. I do not know how to explain it to you because fire is bright and at the same time it is dark. And I cannot explain it. I can only tell you I experienced it firsthand. The first time I was teaching on hell after the experience where my neighbor lost his life in that fire, I, I stopped dead in my tracks in my teaching. If you were with me, you remember it, it just, I suddenly realized I had a, a small glimpse of what this eternal hell must be like. And I mean a very small glimpse and it was horrifying. I saw dark and at the same time fire, but dark at the same time. And yeah, it's, it's, it was horrendous. And um, I trust, I hope and I pray, well I can't pray for him, but that the neighbor who lost his life, I, I hope was a believer. He had, he knew about God. I hope he had put his faith in Jesus for salvation. It's a real place. He died in the fire. In a house? Or a in a house. Yeah. You hope that he's I hope he was. I have reason to believe he could have been. So, I hope so. Couldn't get to do what I wanted to do. Under Acts 2, there's this one, and then there's the Okay, Roger wants me to read you Acts chapter 2, verse 24. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. Speaking about Yeshua Jesus. Verse 31, seeing what was to come, he spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, that he was not abandoned to the realm of the dead, nor did his body see decay. And by the way, that's why he had to raise on the third day. If you don't know, the decay of the body sets in on day four. And Psalm 110 said that God would not allow his Holy One to see corruption, to see decay. So he had to be raised on that third day before corruption would, would start in. Acts 2, 24 and 31 is what I read. Thank you, Roger. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's yeah. how um, forensic pathologists can figure how long a person's been dead for because they know how long the body decays each day. Right. For the well but decay actual the what's called the corruption doesn't start till day four. Right. So if they're measuring something they have to be at least four days prior. Because right. they can say, well they died so many hours ago because there's other evidence that right. they are able to forensically explain, you know, that we can't be yes. Yes. But God's in the details. Mm -hmm. Day three is an amazing study in scripture. Amen. There you see it from, from creation, the third day, you see it all the way through. I've started to trip on this and started to study this and I've brought out a few points in some of my teachings. I'm not yet done studying that. That's fascinating. Maybe we can do that just a break Maybe so. And just do that. Maybe so. If not, I can get it up on the bit.ly site. You can see it in another way um, when I have it completed. But it's amazing. All of a sudden, you're going to see third day all over Scripture, and, and there's a point to it. That's very interesting. I love the way God dovetails everything. Can you kill our air because we got windows open everywhere? Roger, can you stop our air, please? Thank you. Okay, again, questions, comments? Okay, we won't get through 25 today, but let's go a little further. <laughs> and that's okay. We've stayed on the Word of God. That's the only way I want us to ever, you know, go off the trails if we're staying on the Word of God, because that's what we're here for is the Word of God. So, okay, we are back to, well, we're still in verse 8, that he lived that, that he died at a good old age, satisfied with his life, gathered to his people, um, uh, and again, I think we've said it, that it speaks about the soul, it speaks about eternal life. Abraham was still living, not the fleshly Abraham, but his soul is obviously still living. It's his soul that's gathered to his people. Remember that phrase, if you don't, we might have a class in between. I'm either going to get to that again in this chapter or um, next class. But remember that phrase, I'll bring you back to it either in a little bit or next week. So what happened when he was gathered to his people and uh, um, the bodies got to be buried? Verse 9, then his sons, notice plural, his sons, Isaac and Ishmael, Yitzhak and Ishmael, buried him in the cave of Machpelah. 
in the field of Af Ephron, the son of Zohar, the Hittite, facing Mamre. Okay, same description, same everything. This is history being written, so they're being very specific. They took Abraham's body and they buried it in the same cave that Sarah was buried in. Okay, um, we have the two sons coming together. Okay, we haven't heard about Ishmael since he went out. He went out to the east, by the way, remember? Um, but by this point, Ishmael now is 90 years old. Ishmael. Ishmael is 90 years old. Not a son that's young. He's 90 years old. Um, we know that because of the, you know, he was 15 years approximately older than Isaac. And Isaac's 75. So Isaac's 75, Ishmael is 90. He might be 89, he might be 91. But, you know, he's in that, that territory. Who told you that he won the service when God I'm sure that there was contact that he was made aware, even though he moved to the east. They had ways, through the caravans, through however, they had ways of keeping up, you know, with knowing. Think about even when um, Miriam is pregnant with Yeshua and wants to go see her cousin Elizabeth. You know, they had ways that they kept in, in contact to some degree, even though they were living, you know, far apart. But Ishmael's sons would also be grown. They had become the 12 princes by now. Look at verse 16 to see my proof, okay? Because we're going to, whether we get to it all today or not, we're going to see in verse 16, these are the sons of Ishmael, and these are their names by their villages and by their camps, 12 princes according to their tribes. Remember what God said to Hagar? There'll be 12 nations, 12 princes, 12 tribes in that sense, but not the 12 tribes of Israel. You know, but that there would be, this would be what came out of Ishmael, that God said, because remember Abraham said, oh, that he would live before you. And God said, no, he's not the son of promise, but I'll bless him too. So by this point, I hope Ishmael and Yitzhak were able to be friends. You know, they were not able to be friends as young ones. Ishmael teasing Isaac relentlessly to the point that Saraz got in Abraham's face and said, get, get them out of here. I don't want them under our tent roof. I would hope by the time they're 90 and 75 that, you know, that they could have had some sort of a camaraderie. They did share a, you know, a heritage there. Abraham was the father of both of these two. So um, they do come together to bury him, and we don't hear that they went to blows with each other, and they certainly weren't arguing over who gets what, like we do today, for shame. But um, um, no doubt, by this point, they could have been at least, um, what's the word, am amicable in each other's presence. Yes, Maria. Yeah, Roger Hopper, thank you. Okay. Yeah, uh, on Genesis uh, seventeen twenty, it just uh, says exactly what you just said. Uh, but it says, as, as for Ishmael, I have heard you. Behold, I will bless him, and will make him uh, fruitful, and will multiply him exceedingly. He shall become the father of twelve princes, and I will make him a great uh, uh, nation. There you go. So that's the fulfillment of what was promised to Hagar in chapter 17. Thank you for spelling it out for us with the word of God, Maria. Right on, okay. on track, yes. Now, Keturah's sons aren't mentioned as having a part. And they were sent away in verse 6. So it is likely they really weren't a part of this. They're not the, the, the ones that, that mattered, so to speak, in this burial of Avraham. This, this we only find... Isaac and Ishmael involved in. So, again, you can ask about that when you get home, if you've got a question about that. And I don't mean <laughs> home to your house, I mean home to heaven. So, um, his sons buried him in the cave of Machpelah. Verse 10, the field which Avraham purchased, I should have read that before we talked, the field which Avraham purchased from the sons of Heth, there Avraham was buried with his wife Sarah. So it's just being spelled out so clearly nobody can make a mistake. This is historical record. This is who was buried there at this point in time. Now verse 11, it came about after the death of Avraham that God blessed his son Yitzhak, and Yitzhak lived by Bir Lahoi Roy. 
Okay, remember he's been near Beersheba, he's been near Wells many a time in his life. In fact, I think it's seven times that Wells are mentioned in relation to Yitzhak, to Isaac, and we'll get that in a future study coming. So that's just the tip so that when you hear it, you remember it a little better. But Beer Lahoi Roy, Beer means well, and Lahoi Roy is him who lives and sees me. Now you might get little different variations on that because the Hebrew isn't exacting in it, but basically he was living by the well. The well was the place of oath. We see with Avraham that the, the, um, the seven wells, it was the place of, of the oath being made. That was when Be'er Sheva was, was named, Sheva meaning seven, seven wells, and we saw it was like the complete promise, the oath, the oath that, that God had with him. So now we carry that idea of the oath into Beer Lahoi Roy. Here we've got the well of him who lives and sees me. Even though Isaac is not living in Beersheba where he had a time with his father, the Lord is with Isaac and the Lord is seeing him and the Lord is um, living through him in essence, giving him life. Hagar used these same words. When Hagar said that he who sees me, when he when she thought her son Ishmael was going to die, she was, no, 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 I'm sorry. This was when she was pregnant and she ran from Sarah and God sent her back. But he told her, you have a child within you and that child will grow into the, the nations that we just read about. She used that same title. It was the God who sees me, who hears and who sees me, very related in our Hebrew. So it's implying that God's presence dwelt there. Maybe I can put it that way, that the presence of God was in this area. And we do believe that in chapter 24, and verse 62, when Yitzhak was out near Beer Lahoi Roy is when Rebecca, Rebecca was brought to him. So it would have been the, the first place that he met Rebecca. And we know God was was with him in that meeting, bringing the bride to the son, even as we know, we've talked about it today, that in rapture, the bride is brought to the son of God. The one who brings us, the servant, unnamed in chapter 24, a picture of the Holy Spirit, who will take us home to be with, with the Lord, our bridegroom, in that wonderful day of rapture that I believe is coming soon. Hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs> you want it on Wednesday Bible study? <laughs> I'll take that. I'll take it any time. Okay, verse 12. We're going to go in now to the generations of Ishmael. Um, this record probably was given to Isaac at this time, especially if Ishmael is living a distance away. Brothers are catching up with each other, and Yitzhak is the one who is writing what we're reading. Remember how we looked at the Toldot? These are the generations of, and that the, the Hebrew way of phrasing that, it really sounds like books were being kept that were passed down to Moshe. Moses took those books, and he weaved it all together, gave it that continuity, didn't change it, but sometimes he added in more facts, like the name of a place, he explained what that place was because it had developed by the time Moses was writing it. It wasn't as developed when the record was being kept. But that's why Moses is given credit at being the author. He was the overall author. He was the facilitator. But very likely, unless God opened up Moses' brain and said, here's how this and this and this happened, he gleaned it from the writings that were kept, and God kept him in inerrancy as he wrote that what was recorded was exactly right according to how it happened. But Moses wasn't there in Adam's day in the garden to give that record. So either he divinely got it from God or Adam wrote down, God guiding Adam what he wrote, and it was passed down, and then Moses taking it and putting it all together, finishing touches and getting the credit on his end. So at this point, we see it from the Hebrew that this is where Isaac's recording, and he's going to pass it down to the next one who in his lifetime will record, because Isaac can't record after he dies. But he can lean back and tell what's been passed down to him, so that by the time you get down to great, great, who doesn't know, just like today, how many of us really know what happened in our great, great, great grandparents' life? 
Very little. We might have, well, they married so-and-so, and they had so many children, but that's about all the family tree usually has. Sometimes if they stood out for some reason, we'll get a little more detail, but the overall we don't. So this would have been the prime time for Isaac to be writing down, oh, okay, I, I knew you had this son, but I didn't know this son had this son, and I didn't know this one was born, however far and however fast that it carried out. But we are given the generations of Ishmael here, um, and, and they are recorded. It's very interesting. Well, let me read it first, and I'll give you my interesting notes. So these are the records of the generations of Ishmael, Avraham's son, whom Hagar the Egyptian, Sarah's slave woman, bore to Avraham. Spell it out. It's not another Hagar. It's not another Sarah. It's not another Abraham. This is the family that we know about. We know that, that Sarah gave Hagar to Abraham. He went into her, and Ishmael was the product. Now, here's what came out of Ishmael. These are the names of the sons of Ishmael by their names in their order of birth. So we got the oldest to the youngest. And I may slaughter the names. Forgive me if I do. We can find out when we're in heaven one day. Nebaiot, the firstborn of Ishmael, Kedar, Ad Adbil, Mitzam, Mishma, Duma, Masah, Hadad, Tma, Yetur, Nafish, and Kadima. These are the sons of Ishmael, and these are their names by their villages, by their camps, 12 princes according to their tribes. Okay, so everybody, their names in order, and, and they're being recorded here. Now what's interesting is very often in scripture, the line that's rejected, the line that's not carrying the promise, is given first the history, and then it's set aside, and we don't hear mention of them again. Remember, we already commented in class today, we haven't heard about Ishmael. What's been going on? Well, he's brought back in just enough to give us the line to those 12 princes to prove 1720 was God kept his word. Here they are. And as we look at what came out of them, we'll look and we'll see that we're going to see where they went. And as I mentioned earlier, they're very much associated with the Arab nations that we know of today. So that's what we'll get as we go on through this in the next few verses. But then once we're done with this, you're not going to hear from them again. And Yitzhak, the promise line, is going to come back on and we're going to hear a whole lot more as we continue on down because that's what is important. So that firstborn, Nebaiot, um, let's see, okay, he was mentioned, he was firstborn given in verse 13. He may be the ancestor of the Nabataeans, you know, just like America, Americans, Nabai, oh, I'm not probably saying it right, Nabataean, they, they do believe the Nabataeans settled in the um, area of Edom and they built Petra. Roger, go ahead and pop up one of our first maps. I forget what order I put them in. I have several maps that I, he'll be sharing as I speak, so I'll lose sight of my Zoom audience, but I know you're there because he'll be sharing the screen. Um, this one will work. Yeah, this um, one. This one. Okay, I don't want this one right now, and that one's not as good right now. That one's not as good. Go back to the first one. You'll go. You'll see all those in a moment in their detail. Okay, when you see this map, and I know Zoom Room, you're delayed for a moment, but you will get to see it. For those of you looking at it right now, where it says the Kingdom of Moab, and you see the Dead Sea, it's on. Just put it on there. Okay, but it, it mirrors. So. Anyway, that area, if you keep going down south below where it says Kingdom of Moab, that's where Petra is, okay? So when I said that they went into the area of Edom, Edom is, there's Kingdom of Edom. There we go. It, the map does go down low enough. There you go. Um, Roger, can you point to Petra? See it right there is Petra. He's circling it. And then see the big name Kingdom of Edom, okay? Mm -hmm. The water that you see in the middle, that's the Dead Sea, is below the Dead Sea, there you go, below the Dead Sea, and so it's south and east of the Dead Sea. That's the area that the Nabataeans, see the Nabataean tribes um, on the, right my far right? Yeah. There you go. So they would come into that area, we're talking about that whole area where the Nabataeans settled, Eden, Petra, all of that. This was the area that, um, came out of Nabaiot, and, and because it's Nabataean, we believe that's the same name. 
Now the next name in that list, and keep looking at the map, I think we'll leave it up for a moment, we may need to go to the next one, but we'll see. The next name is Kedar. That's, that name is associated with the Arabs also. Um, let me read it for you, but it would be the area of Arabia. So do go to the next map, Roger, while I'm reading other scriptures for them, because I want you to see where Arabia is. Um, you're going to have to probably go to the next one. One of them was, should say Arabia. Uh -huh. There you go. There you go. I, I, I didn't realize how big they were. In my screen, <laughs> I saw the whole thing at once. So um, back up just a little bit. There you go. That's the way I mean. Okay, keep going a tiny, tiny bit more. You can see the big name in gold is Saudi Arabia. Um, but get up here where Jordan is. Can you circle Jordan? Right there, right there. Whoa, 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 whoa. Don't move anymore. Oh, right there. There's Jordan. That's Petra. Oh, sorry. We just lost it. <laughs> um, okay, there we go. Let's show them Saudi Arabia too at the same time though. Um, okay, whoops, go back up just slightly because I want them to see Israel. There's Jerusalem. So you see where Israel is. You see Jordan. Jordan has Petra today. Um, Edom, Moab was right below where the word Jordan is. And now you see the area of Saudi Arabia. That's Kedar, okay? He's associated with the Arabs and being called Arabia. I'm going to read it for you to prove you I don't just make this stuff up. It's going to be, believe me, I couldn't. Isaiah chapter 21. And I will read to you verses 13 and 17. These verses are in your cross-references. Isaiah 21, verse 13, the oracle about Arabia, the verbal given about Arabia. In the thickets of Arabia you must spend the night, O caravans of Dedanites, bring water for the thirsty, O inhabitants of the land of Tima. Okay, now keep that in mind. I think I read a little too far, but keep that in mind. Go down to verse 17. And the remainder of the number of bowmen, the mighty men of the sons of Kedar, will be few, for the Lord God of Israel has spoken. So when he's talking about Kedar, he's talking about the thickets of Arabia. He's talking about the oracle of Arabia. Here's the verbal history. That's Isaiah 21. It's in your cross-references. Isaiah 21, verses 13 and 17. Another proof, because we like more than the word of one, is Jeremiah. Go to Jeremiah chapter 49. Jeremiah in my Hebrew, chapter 49 and verse 28. And we have here concerning Kedar and the kingdoms of Hazar, which Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, defeated. Thus says the Lord, Arise, go up to Kedar, and devastate the men of the east. Remember, this is of the east in relation to Israel. When scripture's giving references in relation to Israel. So we can see how Nebaioth, the oldest, settled in the area a little closer to Israel, Jordan, that area. And then Kedar went a little further south and east, and we've got him settling in the area of Arabia. Now, it's very interesting that these first two are mentioned in the millennium, in prophecy about the millennium. Go with me to Isaiah chapter 60. And remember, the millennium is the thousand-year reign of Christ on this earth, the Messiah sitting on the throne of David on earth, earthly Jerusalem, comma, Israel, the eternal capital of Israel. This takes place after the seven-year tribulation period when the Lord comes back, stops the battle of Armageddon, and sets up his millennial reign. Millennial meaning thousand. And in verse uh, 7 of Isaiah, Yeshahu 60, we read, All the flocks of Kedar will be gathered together to you. The rams of Nebaot will minister to you. They will go up with acceptance on my altar and shall glorify my glorious house. So even though they're of Ishmael's line, even though they are um, Arab, we see they're going to come up to the house of the Lord in Jerusalem, Israel, during the millennium. Bless the Lord and be blessed. God doesn't leave them out just because they're Arabs. That's not that's a false teaching. It wasn't that God only had eyes for the Jews, but he used the Jews and their nation to be his spokesperson to the world. So here is where we see. I fully believe that Ishmael was a believer in the God of Israel. I don't believe that he wasn't. I think he was of a cantankerous spirit. But you'll see when we get a little further down in scripture why I can say that. 
that I, I fully expect to see him. I don't expect that he died without believing in salvation through Yeshua Jesus. The next names that were mentioned in those verses 13 to 15, Abdil, sorry, Abdil, Ad Ba'el, probably from my Hebrew, Masa, Nafish, and Kedema, they were names found in Assyrian inscriptions. Duma was mentioned in Isaiah 21.11, so we'll show you that one. Isaiah 21.11, and don't get rid of the maps because we'll be using all those maps still for a little bit, Roger. Um, the oracle concerning Edom. Remember, Edom was just south and east of Israel. And then we come down further to Saudi Arabia. One who keeps calling to me from Seir, watchman, how far gone is the night? Did I read the wrong? No, no I did read. Okay, yeah, connected with Seir, and that's the home of the Edomites. The Edomites are the descendants of Esau. Okay, so when we, we're going to get Jacob and Esau. We're not going to get there today. We're at 3.30 now. I'm going to try to get through the maps and stop. But when we get down to Jacob and Esau, we're going to see out of Esau, the same way out of Ishmael came 12 princes out of Esau, come the people that are known as the Edomites. The, the Arab nations that are associated with the Edomites are actually half Arab because they're also, they've got Jewish blood in there. They're cousins. They're, they were brothers originally, Jacob and Esau. So you have to realize there's not a total separation. There's not a total casting off. So the Edomites are connected with Seir, the name of a city in Arabia, also Saudi Arabia. I don't believe, I didn't go looking for it on the map because it's an ancient name. Um, but if it's there, and I don't see it quickly. Seir. Seir, S-E-I-R. Yeah. I didn't look for it because that's not important. We've got the area. Tema, the name of a city in Arabia, spelled in scripture T-E-M-A, today or wherever the source, whatever time the source had it from, it was spelled T-E-Y-M-A, but it's still the name of a city in Arabia. And Jatur, and, or Yetwar and Nafish, um, they were tribes on the east of Jordan, so go back up where we can see Jordan for a moment, Roger, there we go, on the east, which is to my right, no, 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 other way, there you go, that's east, okay? On that side, they warred with the tribes of Israel. We read that in First Chronicles 5.19. So, they, you know, they went out, but we're not talking that they went thousands of miles away. They just moved out little by little. I think the same way that we see Bethlehem used to be six miles south of Jerusalem, and now you almost can't tell the difference between the two. Jerusalem grew up some, and Bethlehem grew up some. Uh, here, to give you uh, an example, here would be like Colton and San Bernardino. It used to be further apart. Now you can cross from one into the other and not know you've done it. Um, in my, uh, okay, my dad, of course, is years above me. His spiritual mother was older than he, and she would tell him, <laughs> thank you, you tried to warn me, she would tell him, when it took all day to go from San Bernardino to Highland by horse and buggy. Mm -hmm. Now we laugh at that, you know, a few minutes in the car and we've gone from San Bernardino into Highland or vice versa and again, cross the line and don't even know it. Animals always steal the show. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that's the idea is, you know, the, the growing up that way. Um, let me see, I think that's the end of my maps. Maybe not, there may be some more that will come, but I think it's, <coughs> Let me try to tie up the, this, these thoughts right here. I think I can do it in just a couple minutes. Um, going back to chapter 25, I've gone through the names. Verse 16 of chapter 25, these are the sons of Ishmael. These are their names by their villages, by their camps. I read that. I'm sorry. Um, villages, towns. The Hebrew word is settlements. And the, apparently the settlements would be named after them. We did that here in America. I even have in my family history coming across in covered wagons that there's a place in another state called Chaffinville. The family was Chaffin. They were known for the area, and this, the village got named after them. It's the same thing. Just, you know, whoever kind of was predominant in getting it started, that's often what it was called. And we already read the fulfillment of 12 princes in chapter 17 and verse 20 of Genesis. The Hebrew also uses the word interchangeably ruler. So they were the mayors, they were over the, the cities. And again, when it says tribes or nations, the Hebrew word is tribes, but do not confuse the 12 tribes of 
Ishmael with the 12 tribes of Israel. Those are totally separate. Okay, so verse 17, these are the years of the life of Ishmael. We're going to get his death now. That's all we're going to get out of him is a little bit of genealogical um, information that we need to know how the Arab nations developed. He lived 137 years. Here's our expression again. He breathed his last and died and was gathered to his people. Now here's where I say he must have been a believer because if it's the very same phrase in Hebrew for Avraham as it is for Ishmael, who's Ishmael's people? Avraham was his father. So Avraham's father, Terah, would be his grandfather, the same as it is for Isaac. So if Ishmael is gathered together to his people, it sounds to me like Ishmael went into what we'll call today Avraham's bosom. So that's why I believe that he was a believer. Doesn't mean he acted like it. Doesn't mean that he lived a life the right way because we were told how honorary he was and, and the connotations gave a, an evil intent. It wasn't the line that would carry on. The same way I'm going to tell you Esau and Jacob. One is going to be out as a hunter in the connotations that go along with that. I'll bring out when we get there. The other had the love of the Lord. It didn't mean one's saved and one's unsaved. They both were being raised by parents who taught them about the God of Israel. They, we never read that they were idol worshipers. I, I mean, there are times in their family history, of course, we read that it mixed in and punishment came for that. But if he was gathered to his people, then he's gathered to Avraham, to Torah, to others who had come to saving faith. And so I believe that he also was a believer. Yes? Would it be like they both went to heaven except Ishmael is not going to have any crown and Daniel death? Good way to put it. Good way to put it. In today's verbal verbiage, we would say that they both died and went to heaven. But one has great reward for his works for the Lord, and the other is missing his crowns, doesn't have any of it. But, uh, and as my mom would say, some are saved. We're all saved by grace. Some, some have the smell of smoke on their coattails. <laughs> so, yes, like that. But, again, our salvation is not dependent on our actions. And, and I think we all, sadly, would say that we can point to people in our lives that God alone judges the heart. Anybody can put on a facade, but to our knowledge, they really did accept the Lord. There really was that time when they expressed their faith in Jesus as their Savior, forgiving them for their sins, and yet the actions in their life at this point were now denying it. They've gone into rebellion. Oftentimes that comes out of people's own pride. I want it my way, and God didn't do it their way, and they got mad at God and said, I'm done with you, I won't have anything to do with you. So God knows, he knows the heart, and he judges the heart. But no one wants to go into God's presence with that being our, well, we came out. We want to go into the presence of the Lord, having served him, pleased him, you know, glorified him right to the last moment. You know, like I've said before, I, I would love to either be teaching his word or witnessing to, to someone and I'd like it to be them praying right for salvation when it happens so that they don't get left behind. <laughs> but anyway, it's something for the Lord. That, that's the point. I think, um, can I do verse 18 fast? I think I can. And, and we can recap it next week, but that finishes our thought because then we'll go into Yitzhak's sense. So 18, real quickly, they settled from Havilah to Shur, which is east of Egypt, going toward Assyria. Roger, pop up the one that shows Assyria now. He settled, and notice, in defiance of all his relatives. Okay, this one, some say, even say he died there, and, and the Hebrew guilds itself to that. Um, the idea of the word in, in the Hebrew, the word is nafal, N-A-P-H-A-L, and it means to fall, to bring down, to defect, to topple, to lie. So this one... In the presence of all his brethren, he defied his brethren. He didn't get along with them, and he moved east. You see Assyria? It's up. Yeah, there you go. Roger's circling it now. That's Turkey area. You see Nineveh. We know Nineveh because of Jonah. But you can see Tigris and Euphrates. You know, so you begin to know that area. So where the others are down south, see where Arabia is? Right above the, yeah, there you go. And 
he went up north because he's in defiance of his brothers. Fulfillment of scripture once again. Genesis 16 and verse 12 told us that so clearly. And here's where we read, and this is my closing, so believe me, I'm letting you go. It, and this was speaking of um, Ishmael. This is what God told Hagar when she was pregnant with, with Ishmael. Behold, verse 11, behold, you're pregnant. You'll give birth to a son, and you'll name him Ishmael. Spelled all out. Because the Lord's heard your affliction. And that's what Ishmael means, is that God heard. Um, verse 12, though. But he will be a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against everyone, and everyone's hand will be against him. He will live, and here it is, in defiance of all his brothers. And here's um, um, Ishmael's um, heritage, his, his progeny. The same thing's being said. They, he lived in defiance even with his brothers. And often, and I do not mean this derogatorily, I mean it is factual. Often today, Arabs don't get along with Arabs. We have a number of them that are enemies of Israel, Fatah, Hezbollah, Hamas. If they would ever all get together, it would be a great threat to the nation of Israel. But as long as they're inner fighting and struggling with each other and using up their time, their energy, and their resources, they're less effective against Israel. So it's a blessing. But it's it's just so true that they can't get along. They now, even well, I believe that Ishmael did because he was gathered to his people. And Roger, give me back my Zoom room, please. We're done with the map so I can see people. Mm -hmm. um, but it doesn't mean they were living that way, you know, living it right and living it out. But I do believe, and I cannot say Ishmael's kids, how they turned out, but I would believe that Ishmael tried to pass it down to his children, that, you know, he messed up. Um, but as we go into the Arab world today, so far removed from that time, much of the Arab world is Muslim. Much of the Arab world is in idolatry. You do find Arab believers, but they're a minority. They're not a majority. But God, God's got a remnant with them also, and he always keeps that remnant with Israel. And by the way, I'm not saying the Jews are wonderful people, that we always get along with our brothers. I'll tell you what the jokes are. Three Jews, four opinions. And they'll tell each other their opinions at the top of their lungs. They'll be having what you think is a knockdown drag out. Oops, time to go. Hug each other and go on their way. That's the Jewish way of doing things. So I'm not saying that there are better people or anything like that. I'm not here to say one is better than the other. I'm here to say God chose the Jewish race to work through the Jewish race for his glory, representing him to the world, and he has a future and a plan for Israel that he will complete. But he also says in those prophecies, the nation of Egypt, that they have to come up to have rain in their land, and that there's a time, 40 years I think it is, that, that they uh, suffer the consequences. But 40 years out of 1,000, that's 960 years of blessing. So God doesn't leave the Arab people out. Rowena, you have a comment or a question? And then I think Linda does. I'll go to you right next, Linda. Roger's trying. There you go. You're unmuted. Yeah, okay. Just to clarify, so from Ishmael, we have the Arab nations. Yes. Now, is the Arab the same as Semites? When you say Semites? Semites. Because the word anti-Semitic is so common this day. What? Who are the Semites? The Semites really did take in both because at this time they would be the Semitic people, but Semite has come to refer more to the line of Shem and more to the Jewish line, and when it is spoken of as being anti-Semitic, it's understood to mean anti-Jewish. So it's, okay. it's separate, but back then really the roots were mixed. The roots were there because they had the same father. They are Arab descent, and they are trying to take the land, believing that it should be theirs. Their God is Allah, and they believe that if they bring about chaos and confusion, the Imam will come, who is their spiritual leader, who will bring in Allah's rule on earth, and that's their goal. So their goal is to swallow up Israel because Israel is the enemy in their land, quote. And then they go after the Christians because the Christians also are the enemy of Allah. And so they've got to get rid of them. And in all that chaos doing that, they're serving the purpose because their imam, their religious leader, won't come 
at a time of peace, it comes at a time when there's war and chaos, and so <coughs> the more they can kick up and cause, the, the better, because that'll bring in their ima and usher in their beliefs of Allah being their god. Allah is actually the name for the moon god, and the Muslim faith started in 7th century, 6th century, 600s. Um, it was not there before, but that's what many of the Arab nations are, are believing is Satan's lie against the truth. Linda, let me go to you first, and you have to unmute yourself also. Are you saying no? Okay, okay, no problem. I thought I saw you trying to ask. Sorry, didn't mean to pick on you. Maria, Maria I can tell you want to, so unmute yourself. Roger, I'll unmute you also, and you go ahead. You know, it, it, when you were saying about uh, Ishmael, uh, he had, uh, the, because Hagar, uh, she experienced the presence of, of, of God yes. when they were in the desert and he was dying. Yes, yes. God told him. So told I'm us, sure yeah. that she had to, you know, uh, uh, um, I'm sure even if that little boy was half dead at the time, I think he also uh, had the experience of God. So he knew. Go back, I think. go back to when she's carrying him. That's the first time we hear right. of God's encounter with Hagar on a personal level. And she declares, mm -hmm. the God who sees me. Go back. Yeah. Right, and, right. and she's right. got, you know, she's acknowledging him, listening to him, being obedient to him. He said, go back. She went back. Well, I do yeah. believe she would have passed that down to her son. But, I think so, too. Yeah, yeah. Just because we see it today, just because you have the Lord in your life doesn't mean that you live right and that you do how you should be. You know, they just weren't going to get along. There was two. And then, and, and then, then, then we can also apply it that the only one that knows your heart is the Lord. Absolutely, absolutely. That's why when I tell you I expect to see Ishmael, I do it on the basis of him being gathered to his people, the same way Abraham was gathered to his people, and I know I'll see Abraham. He's called the friend of God. But I'm basing it on what I'm reading. I'm basing it on what right. I'm hearing and seeing. Only God sees the heart. And I do believe, sadly, I believe we're going to be very surprised who we find in heaven and who we don't find in heaven. Because there can be a great, oh, they look wonderful on the outside. And Yeshua called them out and said, you know, you're all whitewashed and clean on the outside, but you're dead man, dirty bones on the inside. There's no faith in you. You know, so, sadly, yes. You know, you know. Also, is, is, when you get to be going to care. We're going to be so glad that we made it. Oh, yeah. yeah. And just to see Jesus. That's it. Yeah, that's what's going to matter to us. Yes. Yeah. But when we're speaking about it in the sense we want to do it for the right reason, we want mm -hmm. to encourage people to either get right with the Lord or get back into right fellowship to move in the power of the Lord, not in, in their own. And so we are, as someone once said, and I kind of like it, we can be fruit inspectors. If you see the fruit of the Spirit it being exemplified in their life, then you're not going to preach salvation to them. But if there isn't any evidence of fruit in their life, then you might need to be thinking and praying for opportunity to speak to them about salvation because maybe they've only had a head knowledge. It's never gotten from the head to the heart. It's got to be in the heart. Even the demons know who Jesus is, and they tremble, and they cower, and they do what he tells them to do, but they're not saved. Knowledge does not save. A heart open to receive Jesus as Savior, that's salvation, and that's, that's the crux of the matter. I thank God he's the judge of the heart and not me. I, I would not want that responsibility because I wouldn't for a minute think I could call it out, you know, easy to call out the ones who are living unto the Lord. But all those who are in between, up and down, and, and can talk a good talk, I wouldn't want to be judging. You know, so. Pray out so you can go. <laughs> Let me pray out real quick, then we can go on with questions, you know, whatever um, comments we can go on. Um, we'll come back next week, and we will get into Isaac's um, generations, you know, who follow Isaac. I think we will get introduced to, I think we will, yeah, it's not that far before um, the birth of the twins comes. There's a whole lot behind that. There's a whole lot in the Jewish background for me to bring to you about birthright and blessing 
There is a difference between those two words. They're not synonymous. Um, but there's a whole lot in there that if you haven't been introduced to, I think you'll find it to be interesting. And if you have heard it, hopefully it's interesting to hear it again. <laughs> okay. Lord God, thank you. Thank you that you are our salvation. We praise you oh, to have left heaven, to come down to this earth to, for the sole purpose of growing up to die on a cross in agony, becoming the sin sacrifice for us. Lord, how do we ever thank you? We just humbly bow before you and give you our hearts. And Lord, hear and see the hearts of those that, that I am speaking for right now that truly have a heart for you, that have accepted you as Messiah, as Savior, who want to serve you, who want to please you. Lord, take our lives, mold us, and let us be a blessing to you in service to you, to carry out what you would have us to do. Let us not be shy. Let us not hold back speaking for you, Lord, because it could be the last time that person would hear the message, and we want to be your your servant giving it. We thank you that none perish because we don't do what we should, but Lord, let us, fill us with your spirit to do all you would have us to do. Strengthen us in your spirit, and may we go out by the very power of your spirit to accomplish what you would have each one of us to do. Thanking you and praising you that we are secure in our salvation, sealed by the spirit one day. Ah, home with you, seeing you face to face and knowing sin and all its ramifications are over forever. Hallelujah. What a promise. What a future. Praise you. Thank you. Thank you. Hallelujah. I, can't, I can say it a million times. It's not enough. It, all in your name, because it's you who does it. You who are praiseworthy. The name of Yeshua, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Can't wait. Can't wait. Can't wait. Yes, Patty. Okay, there's a lot of war in the Old Testament. 